dog has no leash to collar a two-foot with, nor gossip to set true with mean repeating. Our brief is to take disappointment as it comes and not to philosophize it with waddle and daub. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I'm talking about Shakespeare's Dog by Leon Rook. Previously I brought you Wittgenstein's Mistress, I brought you Darkenville's Cat, so now I'm bringing you Shakespeare's Dog. Perhaps next I'll turn to Julian Barnes and bring you Flaubert's Parrot. This book was recommended to me by Matt Booker. I had the extreme privilege to recently be on their podcast, David Laird and Matt Booker of The Great Concavity. I'll put a link to that episode below. Uh, but during a portion of that talk, we started giving each other recommendations and I made the comment that my knowledge of Canadian literature uh, actually isn't that great. And, uh, and Dave Laird even humorously said that his really wasn't either, despite being uh, Canadian. But because of that, Matt brought up Leon Rook, who is a Canadian author, and this strange little book, Shakespeare's Dog. And just as it says, uh, it is narrated by Shakespeare's dog. Now, coincidentally, uh, it would turn out that Leon Rook is a native of none other than this state of North Carolina. I took this book with me on vacation last week. My wife and I went to a COVID deferred anniversary trip to Aruba, as some of you know who uh, follow my Instagram account. And on that note, if you see uh, my skin peeling on my face or nose or ears, please rest assured that I do not have leprosy. Uh, that's just where my skin that hadn't seen the sun in over a year finally uh, met with the Aruban sun uh, and immediately burnt on the very first day. But this book ended up being a lot of fun. It was the perfect vacation book. It is short, however, it's only about um, 160 pages. Uh, I finished almost the whole thing on the flight down to our destination uh, because I couldn't stop reading it. It's written by someone who has really immersed themselves in the language and imagism and imagination of Shakespeare and of the prose and poetic style of the Elizabethan era. It's not written exactly like Shakespeare, uh, but all of the locution, all of the sentence structure and the way that things are expressed have that feel. Uh, and in fact, uh, you may ask how that's so when this is narrated by his dog, who is referred to as Hooker. It is, in the end, uh, as the case is made in this book, it is not Shakespeare himself or Will himself who had all the brains, but rather his dog. It is his dog uh, who is responsible for the bard we know today. So it's a really imaginative and humorous uh, twist on Shakespeare. There's no backstory or any attempt to describe how this ruse of the dog uh, knowing everything about philosophy and history. It, it's the dog himself who ends up introducing the ideas of Aristotle to Shakespeare, by the way. And, and that's also because they're playing on, on the idea of Shakespeare not knowing Greek at all and barely knowing Latin, but instead the dog does and helps him out with ideas from history. As he says, I remembered once talking with Will and him saying dogs were lower than the low. I'd pointed out even Aristotle had noted favorably the link between dog and man, how each shed his teeth similarly and had a single stomach that daily required replenishment. Who? He'd said, and taken out his pen to write it down. Aristotle who? What's he done? But there's no attempt to make a justification, just justification for this. It just is, um, as it would be if the dog was telling in the first person and he refers to humans as two foots or two feet. There's no reason in his mind why he needs to justify any of this to us, the reader. Really what this is, is not so much about the story of Shakespeare's dog and how he came to help Shakespeare be who he is to us now, but really it's just a celebration of and a reverie in the English language. Every page is a joy to read. 
Um, and Leon Rook has a real ear for consonants um, and an eye for image. For, for example, we get such uh, phrases as came bleeping through a break in the mud wall and as though she were akin to a creaking quarry cart. There's a bounty of celebrated Shakespearean insults, and we know a lot of them from Shakespeare today, but this one uh, gives us plenty uh, to add to that repertoire uh, from the dog himself, and there are too many to even begin to list here. But it isn't just completely made up. Uh, Leon Rook does give acknowledgement to different Shakespeare scholars and historians for helping him uh, maintain historical accuracy where he needed to. Um, we also get Hamnet is in here, and we get foreshadowing of, of uh, Hamnet's tragedy. The Dark Lady is here, and it's described in its own conception as to who exactly that is. The dog talks about or references the Geneva Bible, which uh, he says that Will spreads that open on his lap and mumbles over it. And indeed, it is the Geneva Bible that would uh, be, come to be referred to as Shakespeare's Bible. And just in general, uh, the view of William Shakespeare uh, and, and, Hath and and Hathaway, for that matter, from the perspective of this dog is often hilarious. And in, it's divided into four parts. And we spend some time getting uh, a perspective of William Shakespeare and then some time getting the perspective of Anne Hathaway. And it's hilarious the way that uh, the dog depicts this love and love-hate relationship between the two and Will is often locked up in his room uh, scribbling at his rhymes and Anne Hathaway is yelling up at him and he's poking his head out and for example this one passage Will was up at his overhang cursing his script he flung his shutters wide and let out a string of epithets long as a fishwife's arm then slammed the shutters shut and dropped down again to his composing there was scarce no chance of getting the, roo the rogue out of doors today. He was a tedious, formidable hump when he had the muse on him, and no more character than a goose unfeathered. And he had the work piling up now, having made recent voice contract with no pence in hand to the Earl of Worcester's men for a scene or act or skit featuring a prince turned into ass or the other way around, and an upshot of this, he'd been tracking down Hollinshed's chronicles or history for an idea, plus chewing on his toenails. So as you can see, there's this constant mix of the high and the low and uh, glimpses of William Shakespeare, the, the genius at work, but also uh, the very much human aspect of him as well um, that we would only even see from the viewpoint of what we commonly say as a fly on the wall, but in this case is a dog on the floor. There is a plot from the dog's perspective that does give him a conflict to drive uh, the story uh, as he's musing and all these thoughts and, and people around him. Uh, essentially, there's this uh, band of people called the Regarders, and what they get, assemble to do is to go and torture and ultimately kill dogs who have been found to be eating into the livestock. In this case, apparently some deer have gone missing, and they think that there's a dog that's the culprit. And so they're going from village to village, and they're getting close to Stratford-upon-Avon, and um, Hooker, Shakespeare's dog, really does believe that uh, he is, you know, his demise is going to be met uh, at the hands of these regarders. So then in the second part, it moves into talking, the dog reminiscing about the early passions between William and Anne, and then sort of the evolution of their relationship, and then foreshadowing of, of Hamnet. In the third part is when we start to see William Shakespeare as setting his eyes on London town as his destination where he will achieve fame. He wants Hooker to go with him. Uh, we also get uh, this whole... Uh, scene where Hooker thwarts uh, a witch burning and then ultimately saves William Shakespeare's life. In the fourth and final part of the book, uh, we get uh, Hooker's upbringing and how he came to be Shakespeare's liege. Uh, and altogether, all the way through, everything is stitched perfectly. Again, it's a short book, but it's done very, very well. The prose 
uh, is so rich and just really conveys uh, an, a writer who has a keen and intense appreciation for the English language. It also knits together historical fact with nice little anecdotes, good fun, uh, even slapstick comedy in some places, but also uh, shows characters who are very much human and honestly not that far removed from canines, even canines uh, who have uh, an intellect that we've mistaken for Shakespeare's. So thank you so much, Matt Booker, for this recommendation. I had a blast reading this. I will read it again. Uh, I will make this a recommendation not only here in this video segment, but also to people uh, who I, whom I want to just see uh, their reaction to something like this. I've never read anything like it. Go out, check out Shakespeare's Dog by Leon Rook.